Good day, fellow South African learners. My name is Mtutu Zilamini. I am a lecturer at Ethan Zanitivet College under the electrical department where we are offering electrical infrastructure and construction. My subject that I'll be uh, looking into today is electronic control and digital electronics under the topic of uh, fundamentals of electronics. The module is basics of oscillators. So, like we did on the last lesson, we looked into what was oscillation about, where is it used, and how do we achieve oscillation, and what are the conditions of oscillation. We also looked at uh, the different types of oscillators, where we said we have two mainly, which is sinusoidal and non-sinusoidal oscillators. Today we shall continue and look into what we call the types of oscillators under sinusoidal oscillators where we have four different kinds. We have an RC phase shift and then we have a coal pits and a Hartley oscillator and we also have a crystal controlled oscillator. So, our lesson today will be looking into each and every oscillator that we have mentioned. We shall go deep into each and every oscillator one by one. So today we shall start with what we call the RC phase shift oscillator. A resistor, a resistor, capacitor, phase shift oscillator uh, shortly known as RC phase shift shortly known as an RC phase shift oscillator so how does an RC phase, uh, RC phase shift oscillator operate? We now need to do what we call the diagram of the oscillator. The diagram of the oscillator. One, let us draw the RC phase shift oscillator. Guys, I always say to you, you will never know a diagram by simply looking at it with textbook and then you say, I now know this diagram. No, you won't do that. It is practically impossible. You will have to draw the oscillator. Even if you have drawn it at, at, at school, you can draw it at home until you master it in your head. You will be not given any uh, diagram or paper which will give them a diagram. So it's part of your assessment that you should know what we call circuit diagrams. So let's start with an RC phase shift oscillator. Remember we said we need an amplifier for oscillation. I'll simply draw the amplifier, which is called a common emitter configured amplifier. Common emitter configured amplifier, which looks more or less like this, plus VCC, RC, RP, and then we have our output there, and then there down we have our thermal components, RE, and CE. So, let's say we have this kind of amplifier, which is a common emitter configured amplifier. It's a common emitter configured amplifier. What does this mean? It simply means in a common emitter amplifier, in your output, there will always be a 180 degrees phase shift between the output and the input. What does this mean? If you start with a signal like this before your amplifier circuit, in your output, your signal will be at an, what we call an antiphase, an opposite. So it means it will look like that. So that's a 180 degrees phase shift where 
your positive becomes a negative and a negative becomes your positive. That's an antiphase. We say the output in a common emitter amplifier is antiphase. So, now, but this is not an oscillator, it's simply an amplifier circuit. Remember, we say it oscillators, we need the conditions of oscillation, we need one, a 180 degrees, uh, a, a zero degrees phase shift. Two, we need a, a feedback path, which shall give us a positive. Three, we need uh, what we call a constant power supply. So now, let's see, based on those conditions of oscillation, how can we turn the circuit into an oscillator? First of all, we need a feedback. Feedback, this is where we take our output, isn't it? This is V out. So it means feedback. We can have our feedback there. But unfortunately, our signal is an antiphase. That is to say, if we take the signal back to the input, it will come at an antiphase. It will tend to minimize our output. So in that way, our oscillation will tend to dampen, which we don't want. It will tend to decay. So what can we do so that the signal comes back at its original state, at a zero degree phase shift or 360 degrees phase shift? That's when we say we have our tank circuit. Tank circuits will always provide us with a phase shift. So, this kind of circuit is called an RC phase shift. Why? If I were to do this to the circuit, and call this C1, R1, C2, R2, C3, R3. So, now, we have a certain feedback path with some certain arrangement of components. Remember we said it's a resistor capacitor, we have our capacitor, we have our resistor. So now we have this kind of tank circuit, which will provide us with what we call a positive feedback. How does this circuit, this RC network, provide us with a, a phase shift? Let us dissect the RC per stage. If we take one RC stage, let me take this one RC stage here. It will look like this, RC1. If you do remember, and if you look into the diagram, it simply represents what we call a high pass filter. That's high pass filter. So, what does this mean? It simply means that if we're to apply an alternating signal here, we shall have some kind of phase shift. If there was no resistor, the capacitor will prove to give us a 90 degrees phase shift lead. We, we all know that by now. A 90 degrees lead phase shift. So, it simply means that it will be practically impossible to apply the capacitor alone on this circuit. So what we need to do, we need to find a value of resistance that will at least shift this angle from 90 to a certain value that we need. So the capacitor alone can provide to be 0 to 90. So now, once we have that kind of uh, network, let's see. If you do remember, for you to find a certain phase, theta, you need to know your x c and your r. In this case, it will be theta shall be equal to, let's use 10, the actin of x c over r. So now, we can now determine the value of r that will provide us with a certain phase that we need. So for an RC phase shift, for us to have at least a 180 output uh, phase, you will see that if we were to give this a 60 degrees and this other C a 60 degrees again, and this other network RC a 60 degrees, if you were to take into consideration all this, if you say 180 plus 60, it will give you a certain value at 60, at 60. You will see that in the final end, your output towards here, it will be zero degrees or what you call 360 degrees. So it's simple, you can say 180 minus 60, which will leave you with 120. 120 minus 60, it leaves with a a 60. 
60 minus 60, it goes back to zero. So our signal will now go back into the oscillator or into the uh, amplifier at a zero degrees phase shift. So in simple terms, in an RC phase shift oscillator, these networks of RC will now provide us with a phase shift where each RC network practices or imposes a 60 degree phase shift. So you can say 60, 120, 180. So now you will say 180 minus 180, it gives you a zero degrees phase shift. So now going back into the amplifier, it will be at an original state. Amplified again, taken into the output, back into the circuit. The process will continue doing that and that is what we call oscillation. So, these values can, can be used to determine your frequency of oscillation. You can now find the frequency of oscillation where we say for this network, your frequency of oscillation is equal to 1 over 2 pi rc square root of 6. Okay, that's the formula. I am not sure if in your formula sheet it's given, but you should be by now aware of this formula. Where we say, if I were to give you a simple uh, uh, task to define or to find the frequency of oscillation in an RC phase shift oscillator, in that way you will be able to do that. You will be given the values of your C, your R and your, and your, and your constant which is 2 pi RC. So you can simply say, if the values of this are, uh, are different, you can now say R1 times C1, R2 times C2, RD times C3. But in most cases, these values will be equal. So that is why we factor out and then say 2 pi RC, because we know that each must give a uniform change. So it will be 2 pi RC root 6. That is how you calculate your frequency of oscillation. Uh, oscillator number two. It's what we call coal pits. Coal pits. This is the name of the guy who discovered the, the basic of the oscillator. So, now, again, we still need an amplifier. We still need an amplifier circuit. We will take our output there. We have our thermal components so that it doesn't go to thermal runaway. R E C E. We still have R C, we still have R B, we still have our power supply V C C and our V out there. So now if you look into this, it's the same circuit we had here. It's the amplifier stage. So now, we need to take our output back into the input. So, for us to take our output back into the input, let me just use this root now. I'll simply use this root and take it back into the input. This is our input. This is our input of the amplifier. So, still, we have only achieved a feedback path. We haven't achieved what we call a loop gain and also a, 300 and a 360 degrees phase shift. So how do we achieve our 360 degrees phase shift? Let's have our tank circuit now here. So now I'm having a tank circuit. What I will do, in a coal pit, you will have two capacitors dissected like that with an inductor. This is an LC circuit. We'll call this C1, we'll call this C2, we'll call this L1. That's our, that's our tank circuit there. It is called a coal pit oscillator. Well, it uses capacitors which are connected in this format. So how does we, how, how do we achieve our phase difference or our phase shift. Okay, so again I will also dissect the tank circuit so that you can now understand what or how do we 
achieve a phase shift. Let me dissect the tank circuit. In an LC oscillator, we have a setup which looks like this. Just the tank circuit alone. C2, C1. Or let me just redraw it so that you understand it much better. Let me just redraw it so that it becomes much simpler to understand. Can I have a marker which is now writing? Okay. So, what, uh, what, uh, how do we dissect it? Let's simply say we have our inductor at the top there. And we have one of our capacitors there. We have the other capacitor there. And we ground them. Remember, remember, they are just grounded like this. Okay. They are just grounded like this. So we can look into them as this. So if we call this, if we call this capacitor C1 and we call this capacitor C2, it simply means that there will be a voltage that will be developed across C1. And that voltage is the same as the output voltage. That's where we measure our output voltage. C1 is connected between the collector and the ground of the circuit. So now, C2 is connected between the transistor space, you see, the transistor space, and the ground. That's where we take our feedback voltage. So you see now, let's assume that L1 here, L1 here becomes our, our voltage source by then. So, if L1 becomes our voltage source, it will simply say, I will induce a voltage on both of these capacitors. Let me put polarity on these capacitors. One will be looking that direction, the other one will be looking that direction. So what does this mean? These capacitors are 180 degrees out of phase with each other. So, it will simply induce the voltage in these capacitors. So, once it does that, a certain current will be flowing there, a certain current will be flowing there. So, this, this voltage will change now, will reverse the direction with respect to the polarity of the capacitor. So, the first time the, capacitor, the, the inductor induces, this will provide a, 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 an antiphase to that one, which is 180 degrees, and that will provide an anti. So, when the inductor again reverses the voltage, this capacitor will give an opposite to that. So in that way, we can now achieve what we call a phased or a changed phase of the voltage back into the amplifier. So that is how, why, how a cold pits operate. So in that, we can have what we call the frequency of oscillation. The frequency of oscillation of this, frequency of oscillation, FR, in a cold pits shall be equal to 1 over 2 pi, which is a constant. Then we have the square root, it's an LC field, it's a, it's a, it's a tank, LC, T. Remember now the capacitors, if you look into them, they'll be connected in a series format. So what do we say? Where CT, where the total capacitance, when capacitors are connected in series, they are added up as resistors in parallel. So it's a product of a sum. Now you can find your total capacitance which will represent your CT now. So that in that way you can now determine your frequency of oscillation. The next oscillator under our LC oscillator is what we call a Hartley oscillator. You will see I will simply erase this and erase that. So if you are good in cramming, you will, you will find this useful. So this is what we call a Hartley oscillator, a Hartley oscillator. As you have noticed, I only changed the tank circuit. All the other components remain the same. 
where we shall call this L1 and L2. So just like the cold pits oscillator, our phase shift is now provided by this kind of oscillator, which now instead of capacitors, we have inductors. So you would remember by saying a oscillator, a cold pit has got capacitors. Capacitance, C. Hardly for inductance. Inductance, H, Henry's. So now you know that if they ask you to draw a Hartley or a Colpitz oscillator, the only difference there, it is the tank circuit. Even here, the simple explanation is the same as that of a Colpitz. Now, what changes now here on the formula, it's now we say LT, C. Now we have got a combination of inductors instead of capacitors. Where LT now, where LT is equal to L1 plus L2. I will not go for the magnification factor. For simpler explanation, let's say if you want to know the frequency of oscillation, once you know the values of L1 and L2, that's where LT comes in. You say the value of LT is equal to inductor 1 and inductor 2. So that is how an oscillator, a Hartley oscillator and a cold pit oscillator operates. So they are both used to generate a sine wave at audio range, somewhere around a few kilohertz into a gigahertz range. So now, the last but not least oscillator we shall talk about is what we call a crystal controlled oscillator. A crystal controlled oscillator. So, the word crystal, these are minerals, natural minerals. They are commonly used uh, as quads or what we call Rochelle sort. Those are natural elements that exhibit what we call a piezoelectric effect. They exhibit what we call a piezoelectric effect property. So they are highly stable, very stable, most commonly used oscillators. Oscillators nowadays, they, most of them they use what we call crystal oscillators. So mostly they use what we call quads, because quads it's cost effective, let me not say cheap, quads is cost effective than the Rochelle set. So but the property they possess is the piezo electric uh, effect. We have a circuit symbol of a crystal. This is a circuit symbol of a, a crystal. A circuit symbol of, of a crystal. Where we have the crystal itself, the crystal and then conducting plates. So, that's a circuit symbol of a, a crystal. So, how does the piezoelectric effect come into place? The piezoelectric effect is simply means that it simply means that if you were to put or put this crystal under some mechanical strain, under some mechanical strain, that is, you apply stress onto the crystal, it will tend to give you some kind of an EMF. Okay, it will generate an EMF here. It will generate an EMF. If you apply mechanical stress onto this crystal, it will tend to generate a EMF. That's one part of the piezoelectric effect. If you apply a mechanical stress, the crystal will tend to vibrate and then give you an EMF. So it is true that if, again, you were now to apply an EMF, an alternating EMF into the crystal, the crystal must now tend to vibrate. Okay, remember we were vibrating the crystal to have an EMF. Now we are having a source going back into the crystal. The crystal must tend to vibrate. It is sometimes called reverse well, uh, piezoelectric effect. So, in that way, it means there's some kind of vibration. And that vibration is determined by the physical, physical dimension of the crystal. 
So they will be cut in such a way that they give you a certain level of vibration that will give you some kind of oscillation. So in that oscillation, it is where we say, now, instead of all those components we had, instead of all those components we had in our amplifier stage, instead of all the components we had in our amplifier stage, we no longer use the, uh, the cold piece or the Hartley or the uh, RC phase shift. Instead now, we shall take this and we can have a connection of the crystal which will now vibrate and then convert our signal back into the input as a zero degrees phase shift. There is an equivalent circuit of a crystal oscillator, but due to time constraint, I will explain it some other time. So, we can connect it in a series format or we can also connect it in a parallel format. This is our crystal there in a series, in a series. and we can also co connect it in a parallel format. Let me just put it there. So instead of uh, uh, the inductor in a cold piece, instead of the inductor in a cold piece, we put the crystal there. That's parallel resonance. We call it parallel resonance. And you have your capacitors this side. You see, it looks like a... So now, this was series resonance. And this is what we call parallel resonance. So these are the two kinds in which a crystal oscillator can be connected to provide us with a phase shift. The phase shift is achieved by means of what we call the piezoelectric effect, as we've explained earlier on. So the questions that may come in there is for you to understand how to connect a crystal control oscillator in a series format or in a parallel format. The understanding of the piezoelectric effect, the application of all these oscillators we've talked about, and the principle of operations for all the oscillators we've talked about. Remember, we started with an RC phase shift, we talked of the LCs, we had a cold pits, we then had a Hartley, and now we were talking of the crystal controlled oscillator, which is the most commonly used oscillator uh, we have nowadays. So if you think of your processors in computers, that's where you have your crystal uh, oscillator. Like we say, it is highly stable, very, very much highly stable in high operating frequencies. You know your processors, they are in gigahertz. You see, we need a very, very high stable oscillator to clock or to determine the speed of your processing in your computers. For today, our topic will end there. Uh, for further uh, clarification, you can contact us on our uh, web, which is atlanzenicollege.co.za or our, on our media platforms, which is uh, Facebook and the Twitter page in what we call Atlanzeni Tivet College. I thank you.